tell everybody on TV I'm not called it. Is that it? And I too remember. I'm sorry by the grace of God and that's the only way I know it. Everything I've done gotten here. I know that um, a lot of a lot of what got me here was also the grace of God. Because I couldn't have uh, couldn't have needed the questions or had the questions, I don't think, that I, that I try to find out the answers to these days without the grace of God. I started off by drinking a music career. Well, I guess early 60s when I was somewhere around uh, 7 or 8 years old I uh, grew up in an alcoholic family my father was an alcoholic and even though I saw the problems that alcohol caused in our family I still found it attractive for some reason I don't know what that was I thought I was missing something I was always a kid who was afraid I was going to miss something Somewhere along the line, I started trying to uh, find out why my father would go back and, and continue to drink, even though every time he did, I saw what happened, which was big fights, you know, violence. Um, and we were always real scared of him. But he continued to do it anyway, and I never, never did understand what that was until one day, a few years later, I realized that I wasn't doing anything differently other than making a little bit more money and add a few drugs to it. Um, I guess about seven or eight years old, I started stealing drinks. Either, uh, well, my parents used to have these, these 42 parties and quite a few people would come over and they'd be uh, having a time Collins or whatever you want. And when somebody wasn't looking, I'd take one of the drinks and run in the kitchen and you know, make them a new one. And, uh, <laughs> refresh their drink, you know. It's just that I would refresh my memory about what it tasted like a lot of the time. I never really, I never really thought that it tasted very good or anything. And then, then one day I tried to, I tried to uh, make myself a drink out of the pan starter and the freezer. It didn't taste very good either. I guess it's the wrong brand. So. But somewhere along the line, I started finding that attractive something. About the same time, my father, uh, here you know the throat doctor who, it was general practice with him when, when you went in for him to take a look at the nose, he would squirt you full of blood. I later found out with a strong solution of liquid cocaine. And I never really knew why my face was numb when I left there and why I felt a little different, but I later on found out that I didn't know how to breathe in that stuff. So this is a nose spray he gave you. The first bottle said you. You know, once every 24 hours, the second bottle said use two or three sprays every 12 hours, and the next one said use as needed. And I did. <laughs> but I guess I was going into junior high. It was when I started, when I really started trying to drink. We had moved to Graham, Texas, and I really didn't want to go at all. Um, I'd, I'd gotten the first band that I really wanted to be in, and was really excited about it. And we had to move, and I had to give up everything, including my weight. We got to Graham, and uh, my parents told me we were going to be there for about six weeks, and that was about six weeks into the six months that we stayed there. While I was going to school there, well, actually the first day I went to school there in Graham, to show you what kind of how much I liked it. I got kicked out of school three times the first day. And uh, I didn't do anything. I just went to school and they didn't like how my belt was, uh, they didn't like how my hair was cut twice. And uh, I real quick found this guy that sold, sold out the filter bottles full of, full of solid mesh. And uh, I continued to find him every day. Even though I didn't, I didn't like how it tasted, I think it just kind of helped me smooth along. Because there wasn't anything that I really wanted that I could beat up all the time. And there wasn't anybody complaining to me. 
we stayed there for about six months and finally I just told my parents that I wasn't going back to school anymore. And that ended up being about the same time we moved back to Dallas. And back in Dallas for me was I didn't realize what I was doing at the time, but really all I all I really was doing here at the time was uh well I was trying to play music in the end, but but the main thing I was doing was hanging out with the kids down the street. And uh what they did all the time was see how they could get high this way or that way, you know. And I thought that well, all I was doing was just trying to be in with these, you know, these kids. What I was really doing was learning how to get high and stay high all the time and run away from what was going on. Which was, uh, I guess what was going on really was that, uh, you know, people grow up and they learn things about living life and, and grow. I didn't, uh, I never, they never told on me. I just thought you kind of went from day to day and got older and then things happened and graduate and or quit for or whatever. Being great, I learned. Uh, I just learned how to bag glue and how to how to figure out this pill with this kind, this with that kind, and you hit real hard on the joints. You might get blood. You got scared scare too, though. At the time. <laughs> the thing was, that was the only thing I knew how to do. The only thing I knew how to do was just try to try to get by every day. I wasn't really learning anything about living life. There was really no information at home. Because I, I couldn't, it was pretty violent in my house. I couldn't go and, and ask my dad about things. Um, I couldn't go ask my dad about, about school or about girls or about anything because it, uh, it was pretty much you're supposed to know that stuff on your own. Or just leave me alone. Let your stuff get it out of the room, you know. So I, uh, I just continued to try to find out things from the kids down the street. And that wasn't the way to go. I didn't know that. What I did keep learning though was about was about bands and what not to blame not to blame my drinking or anything on bands, but I sure learned a lot of bands there. Because <laughs> that was and still is, unfortunately, a lot of in a lot of places that's where a lot of the myth about it's real neat to get high, or real cool to get high. Where I learned a lot of it. Because a lot of the people I really looked up to really knew how to drink, really knew how to get high. And uh, along with every time I would get in a better band, it seemed like there were better drugs. <laughs> and uh, a better brand of a gin or whatever. You know. And I always thought I had to keep up. I just thought I had to keep up. Why that was, I don't know. I would see, uh, I would see someone I really cared about and know that they, this, this is a pattern that's gone on most of my life and I still don't understand why it's practicing or has been. I would see someone who I really cared and loved, you know, cared for and loved and that they couldn't do anything unless they were shooting something. And I would see that it would be literally killing them and that would be a good reason for me to try it. I don't know. I don't understand that. That's what that's the pattern I developed. I saw it with my father and saw it with very close friends and I've seen it with people who are no longer alive, you know. I'm glad to say that I'm not doing that anymore. Because there was a stage in my life where I got to uh, experiment. Not like I thought experimenting was in the first place, but what happens to you if you do this much? There was a time in my life when uh, a normal day would be to pull out whatever I could get my hands on and do it all at once. It wasn't do it till it's gone, it was do it all right now. And it would be enough to kill somebody. But for some reason, that was what I did. And I would sit there and go, well, this is what happens to me. And stay alive somehow. And I got it in my head that that was a I don't know, somewhere along the line, I got this verse, it's not even a verse, it's just something in the Bible where uh, in the last day people will be trying to kill themselves and can't. And that's what I thought I was doing. To me. For some reason, I thought I couldn't die. I guess that's a Superman deal to get. Through the years, all this progressed, and I just, 
got to where uh, everything I was doing was on the road to killing me. The only thing that I was doing that wasn't structured was trying to play music. But that was really quickly everything else. I still cared about someday finding something that meant something to me inside and with another person or with other people. I still cared about growing somehow. But bit by bit, all of that was going somewhere in the past where uh, I couldn't reach it anymore. It was like a, it was like a, something that I couldn't reach anymore, something that I just could dream about. And the things that I was doing every day was more like a trust just to keep keep going because I didn't know how to stop anything I was doing or the predicaments I was in. Then one day about plus than three and a half years ago, I started realizing that I could not live on the way I was going, but I could not stop you. I didn't know how to stop, and I knew that I couldn't keep going. That was a real strange place to be for me, because I literally could not imagine the next day without a big bag of dope and several bottles of whiskey. I thought that, uh, literally what I thought was that I would go on doing that until I died and then it would be a lot better because I don't have to deal with it anymore. And in my mind that seemed like a real good solution because I wouldn't have to deal with it anymore but people that I was mad at would. I don't know why that seems so neat to me. Uh, I don't know why I was that mad at you, you know? I guess I was probably mad at myself. That's really what it was. Because to be honest, at the time, I thought most people were really uh, trying to get revenge on me or whatever, and that's why they did the things that they were doing. Really. The truth of the matter was that I was just trying to get revenge on people that I couldn't understand. But instead of, instead of doing it until I died, what happened was uh, I collapsed. And just gave up. It was, it was funny because I saw it coming for a while. And the reason that I wouldn't let go and give up that fight in the first place is because of what other people would think. You know, what they would think. Not that uh, they would find out that I was getting loaded, and not that they would find out how bad off I had gotten. But it was that they would think that I was weak because I gave up. And uh, it took a lot to find out that that was the stronger thing to do, was to say, I can't do this anymore. I have to live instead of die. So I woke up. So I, woke up I got up and went to a friend of mine's hotel room and uh, sat there shaking and said, you know, this is what's going on. And uh, they called me an ambulance. And we were in Germany at the time. We went through went to this hospital and uh, somehow, somehow I got the nerve to get out of the hospital real quick because um, I just thought it was kind of strange. They kept asking me questions and then ignored me when I answered them. And uh, then, it, then it dawned on me that they were speaking German. <laughs> and <laughs> no wonder they weren't listening, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I did get out of there. And went to a, it was a couple of days later, but I ended up going to a hospital. They're going to see a doctor in London. And he, he was someone that I'd heard of, that I knew that could do some, just could do some good and give me some help. And he put me in a hospital for a few days and, and, uh, 
kind of looked out after me for a little bit while he basically detoxing me. He said basically detoxing because the guy didn't have that, that conventional idea of a detox. It was, uh, if I needed, if I really needed a drink, I could have one. If I really thought I really needed a drink, he thought I should have one within about a five day period. Because just the way he looked at it and the way he told me was, if you've been drinking for 25 years, you're not going to stop in a minute, you know. Instead of giving me a peanut barber call or whatever it is that he would give you, he gave me, he just said, you can go have a drink if you really need one over the next five days. And in fact, he gave me, he gave me a drink on my birthday, which was my husband. He kept the same name. What really happened after that was I got out of the hospital and flew back to the States to get a treatment and I tried to get drunk on the plane. It didn't work. It didn't work. And what I had done was I went, this is pretty funny to me, I went to my mother, said, she'd come over to see me in the hospital, I called her up and said, I called her and my girlfriend and said, I come in the hospital, this is what's going on. They both were there the next day. And I'm so grateful for that, it means a lot to me. They, uh, we were on our way back States. And I'm um, sitting there next to my mother, and I didn't have any money, so I borrowed twenty dollars for a cigarette from the plane. And uh, she knew it was on the machine. Yeah. <laughs> I went and tried to find out how many crown rolls I could get, you know. And uh, there's never enough. I, I learned that a long time ago. There's never enough help, and there's never enough to drink. It's either too much or not enough. It's never just enough. But I, uh, I went and tried anyway. And I went back and I felt, I don't know, I felt guilty already. I'm real good at the guilt. You know, I went straight back to the seat, sat down next to her. You know, this is not what I did. You know, I shouldn't kind of do that. And, uh, anyway, we went back, we got, we got and landed and, and, uh, I went to the hotel room, stayed there until the next day when we were treated. I didn't expect to find out in treatment that was one of the, because it's like the very end. That's what I found out. It wasn't uh, what I thought it was going to be at all. I went through this record stuff, you know, what is it, not that I'm here every day, and, you know. <laughs> and, and I don't want to be here and all, you know, all this stuff. Once I, once I got, once I started paying attention to what was going on in treatment, to recovery, it's been something that I've really wanted ever since. Not always been real good at sticking to a good strong program, but at least I know that when I'm able to find those steps in my life, it works. And it's really the only thing that does. Because anything else I'm doing is just trying to fix something else up to look the way I want it to look, or to be the way I want it to be. Instead of working my way into living life. But what I found in treatment was the same thing that I find in a meeting when I'm in the right place. In my heart at the meeting. And that's a bunch of people trying to help each other live life and grow it. It's always been something that I wanted to know about. And it's always been something that I've wanted to do. It's not always been something that I've done. Sometimes I don't even know what grow means. But it's something that I, I find every once in a while. Once in a while I find grow. And then I feel like me. If that's not where I'm at, then I feel like a shell. With a bunch of static going on. That's really the way I feel. I don't know, in, in the program, they have found the only real lasting happiness that I've ever had. And it lasts whether I can really reach it or not. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not, but I know that it's there even though I can't always see it. Because I know it's not out of, it's not of something that I've made or bought or conned somebody out of. It's something that's bound to be real.
and I see it I see it when I see it other people come out of a real hard place to be into a more comfortable place for themselves I know that must be growth it's not just a new pair of boots or something I don't know, the hardest things that I've learned so far, I guess, is probably letting go of my own way, getting my own way, other people acting the way that I think they should act, or looking the way that I think they should look. I'm not out of that yet. It's just... That's my way. My way isn't the right way at all. And it's hard to admit that. It's hard to admit that I don't know it all. That's what I used to think. I used to think that if it wasn't done my way that it was completely wrong and it couldn't be anything close to right because you just didn't know. I know it's kind of, it's kind of sometimes I find out that it's, it's real comfortable not knowing everything, not knowing anything, in fact. It's funny, I'm really uncomfortable saying that right now. <laughs> That's the truth. I, I just know that it, when I come to meetings, when I take the time to pray and to listen and to take a look at myself and try to change that I grow. And when I try to offer that to someone else, I feel better and that I don't have any needs to drink or to take any drugs and if that's what this program does that's all it does then it's helped me a whole lot because that's all I used to know was drinking and using drugs it's really all I knew because I didn't know how I felt I still don't always know how I feel a lot of times I uh, I still find myself confused about what I think and what I feel. I don't know the difference in reality. And that's a scary place to be a lot of times. But slowly, day by day, that's working out. It's working out for the better. It's been... Uh, about three and a half years, I guess. Close to three and a half years. Since I've had to drink. And it struck me, it struck me New Year's Eve that to go and do what I had to do New Year's Eve was uh, a lot different this year than I've noticed it being in the past. In the, a couple of years ago, it was like this. Last year, it was kind of a daze. I was sick, but it was kind of a day. This year, I was actually happy to be alive. And noticed that I didn't have to be high to be up till 5 in the morning or whatever it was. And that, that I could look out and, and realize that starting a new year with, with new things to try to do, new things to try to care about. And one of them was me and one of them was y'all. And what, what I do with my life. Commitment. You know. Commitment has been another thing I've never been very good at in my life. But I could get caught up in something. Real good. You know. I could get caught up in the, in the miracle in my hair. You know. Or uh, Whatever. But commitment has not been something that I've been very good at. Because I was more scared of making commitment than I was following through. But I realized that I'm still alive now. And that's, a, that's an amazing thing to me. When I was 17, I thought I wouldn't make it to 21. When I made it to 21, I thought something was, something's up, you know. <laughs> you know, what's going on here? <laughs> Yeah. Um.
when I passed 30, I thought something's wrong. <laughs> I don't know. It's, I'm just glad to be alive today. Glad to be alive today. I don't know. I don't really have a whole lot to say about anything other than knowing that if I let this program, if I let God do what He's going to do in my life through you or through whatever, that it's a whole lot better than I ever could have done it myself before I came to this program. And thank you all for letting me be here with you. Whether I know what to say about it or not, it means a lot to me. Thank you. Okay?